Well, good afternoon, one and all. I'm so sorry I can't be with you today. Unfortunately, I tested COVID at the very beginning of this week, so you probably wouldn't want me uh, with you there in person today. So sorry that I have to come to you uh, via video. I, I thought today we'd take a look at an intriguing little story that's captured at the very beginning of John chapter 12. Matthew and Mark also capture the same story in their Gospels. It's the story of Mary of Bethany, not to be confused with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she's busy. She's busy worshipping. She's anointing Jesus with oil. Now, before we read the scripture verses together, it's important that we know a quick bit of context, because this is a very significant moment in Jesus's ministry. John chapter 12 marks the conclusion of Jesus's more public phase of ministry as the plot to kill him deeply intensifies. Now, up until this point, from the very moment that John the Baptist came along, announcing, if you remember, back in John chapter one, pointing at Jesus, look, there is the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. Well, Jesus's ministry from that moment onwards was nonstop and it was very public. You'll remember from the gospel stories, even when Jesus went to find some R&R, people still found him. Well, as we enter into John chapter 12, the tone changes quite dramatically. The curtains on the stage close and Jesus heads backstage, but his ministry doesn't stop. Everything becomes more reflective, more sobering as Jesus enters into a week long private stage of his ministry before his earthly journey concludes in death and, of course, in resurrection. Well, let's turn to John chapter 12. I'm going to read from verses 1 through to 11. It says this six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus's honour. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary took about half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus's feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, the large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So I thought it'd be really good for us to think about what it means to live out this biblical call to worship authentically, to worship authentically. Well, first off, let me begin by defining what I mean by worship, worship by telling you what worship is not. Now, none of these things I, I think will surprise you. Worship is not singing songs, although, of course, our worship might include that. Worship is not what we do on a Sunday morning in our churches, although, of course, it might include that too. Worship is not our traditions, our liturgies or our confessions. Worship has nothing to do with whether we're charismatic, programmatic, dramatic or asthmatic. Worship is not about the mountaintop experiences that we might have on our journeys of faith, although, of course, it might well include all of that. You see, worship is not about us. In worship, God is our primary audience. Now, churches stumble, don't they, an awful lot about worship in your own church context. Think about them now. I would be very surprised if you haven't heard all sorts of opinions about worship, uh, about what worship is or is not. People will have told you, I'm sure, whether or not the worship you've been involved in was good or it was bad, whether it excited them or it did not. I can't tell you how many people have joined and left the churches that I've led because of their corporate worship experience. 
Now, I suspect that Sunday lunch times are the worst for it. I wonder how many times on a Sunday over lunchtime throughout the UK and around the world, this refrain gets voiced. I didn't get anything out of the worship today. That sermon, wow, I got nothing out of that. I didn't get anything out of the singing as we gathered in church. And you know, my sense is, is that sentences like this are dry rot in the church family. Why? Because they utterly miss the point of what worship is and who it is for. Complaining eliminates your ability to worship. Worship was never supposed to be about you or me. Worship is something we give. It's not something that we take. Now, it should be said when we worship, some of these more self-centred outcomes might be a byproduct of our worshipping. But here's the thing. They should never be the primary focus. And yet, sadly, too often they are the main thing. It's all about me, Jesus, and all this is for me, as if you should do things your way. Can you tell I'm not a worship leader? Well, Warren Wiersbe once said this, if you worship because it pays, it will not pay. If you worship because it pays, it will not pay. So if this is what worship is not, how can we then define it? Well, way back in 2002, when I was at Bible college, I attempted to write a definition of worship in an essay. Now, I don't think this is perfect, but this is where I landed. Worship is offering the best of who I am in response to who God is. Offering the best of who I am in response to who God is. Now, worship is something that's very difficult to define. Have a go at it on your journey home today. I think you'll struggle. But authentic worship is what we see happening in our scripture reading. And interestingly, there's not a single worship song to be heard and there's not a single sermon to be critiqued. But what we can see is the priceless and the prideless heart response of a woman to who Jesus is and what he has done and what he is about to do in his death. In fact, maybe that's a better definition of worship. Worship is our heart response to who Jesus is and what he has done. In John chapter 12, in addition to Jesus, there are three other characters that are mentioned. And I think each of them has something to teach us about authentic worship. Well, one of the characters we see is Martha. Her authentic worship flows from a servant heart. Martha is in verse two. She's doing what Martha does best. She's serving. Once again, she's busy pottering behind the scenes whilst everyone else is having dinner. Now, you might recall that Luke tells her a different story about Martha and she's moaning. Lord, don't you care that my sister Mary has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Well, Jesus on that occasion has to give her a gentle rebuke. He says to her, you're worried and upset about many things. But Mary has chosen what is better. What a contrast today where Mary is serving with a totally different attitude. And what we learn from Mary is this, is that being a servant is an act of authentic worship. But what makes that authentic worship acceptable to Jesus is doing it with the right attitude. Now, I get the sense from the text that Martha's ministry of service was actually enabling the different ministries of others. That's significant. Her servant hearted worship was enabling and facilitating the ministry of others, even the lavish worship of Mary. Now, I wonder if I can give you a challenge today. And it's this. Regardless of what your ministry context is or your area of service within worship in your church, can I encourage you to encourage others and even yourself, especially those who are serving quietly behind the scenes? The quality of humble service is a measure of greatness. Your servant heartedness in those contexts and the servant heartedness of others is in fact an authentic act of worship that also enables the ministry of others. And then we come to our second char character who's Lazarus. Now his worship is silent witness. No, not the BBC uh, drama, but silent witness nonetheless. He was a first person witness of the miracle working power of Jesus. He is literally living proof of what Jesus is able to do in a person's life. But you'll notice what Lazarus does not do in our scripture reading. He does not make himself 
the focus of attention and Jesus, the sideshow. Do you know what I mean? Look at me. I'm the one that Jesus healed. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. Check me out. Touch me. Poke me. Would you like my autograph? Would you like uh, me to uh, share my story so it goes viral on social media? Instead, Lazarus is simply a silent signpost to Jesus. What's so intriguing about Lazarus is the scriptures never record that Lazarus said a single word and yet he is still a witness. That's challenging. It's very challenging, especially for those of us like me who are involved in platform ministry. It's what Jesus has done in Lazarus's life and his desire to signpost others to Jesus that makes him such an authentic witness. What's the most important quality of an authentic worshipper or even a worship leader? I wonder if you've ever pondered that. What is the most important quality of a worshipper? Well, I think we have to say it's a love for Jesus. It's a desire not to make Jesus the sideshow. The passion is Jesus. The reason is Jesus. The meaning is Jesus. The heart of it all is Jesus. In fact, that's what makes worship good or bad. It's really about our heart response. Lazarus's heart response is incredible. He doesn't point to himself, but instead he's a silent signpost to Jesus. And then we have Mary. Well, what you notice about Mary is that she is always at the feet of Jesus. Mary is content to go to the feet of Jesus and stay there. And I have a prayer for myself. Maybe this is a prayer for you as well, that my heart would be more like Mary's. If I'm honest, I can get very easily distracted. It's so, easy, so much easier, isn't it, to proclaim Christ publicly from the stage than it is to do the hard graft sometimes of encountering him in private. Did you notice in our scripture reading that Mary took a pint of expensive perfume and she pours it over the feet of Jesus? Well, so what you might be thinking. But it should be noted that this wasn't some uh, cheap odour toilet. This was, as Jesus is so keen to point out in verse five, the value of a year's wages. We're talking M&S perfume here. We're not talking little. Well, the average salary in the UK is reported to be somewhere around £25,000. In this moment, Mary is taking £25,000 and she's pouring it at the feet of Jesus. Can you imagine the smell? The whole house must have just filled with the smell of this perfume. £25,000 worth of perfume. This is a moment of worship. It's a moment where worship becomes a fragrance that fills the entire house. I love this image. When a worshipper, when an authentic worshipper pours out their heart, there's a contagious, delicious smell which fills the room. It would have been such a sweet, refreshing smell in contrast to the dry, arid smell of the streets that would have been outside the house where they were gathered. I love to be around worshippers but worshipers because hearts responding in worship is probably one of the most attractive things about a follower of Jesus. It can become contagious. Wow, they love Jesus. I, I want to know him like they know him. Paul said something very similar in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. This is from the message version. In Jesus, God leads us from place to place in one perpetual victory parade. Through us, he brings the knowledge of Christ. Everywhere we go, people breathe in the exquisite fragrance because of Christ, we give off a sweet scent rising to God, which is recognised by those on the way to salvation. An aroma redolent with life. Isn't that a great phrase? An aroma resident with life. Our love for Jesus ought to be spilling out so that other people can spot it, or we might say so that they can smell it. And I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to add your smell, or maybe it's better to say your fragrance, to the context where God has called you to serve. Allow your heart response to Jesus to fill the room as a sweet fragrance that's attractive to others. In the words of Graham Kendrick, if he's not too old school to quote on an occasion like this, may the fragrance of Jesus fill this place. The lovely fragrance of Jesus rising from the sacrifice of lives laid down. You see, it's about what we give, not what we take. Of lives laid down in adoration. Does your worship permeate the room or better still, the world? There's nothing more attractive than genuine worship. 
There's nothing more attractive than a smelly worshipper. True worship is priceless to the heart of Christ. You know, I think there's a massive challenge in the example of Mary. And it's this, it's to respond to your heart and not to your critics. To respond to your heart and not to your critics. In verse four, suddenly the mood at the dinner party becomes very tense, doesn't it? Have you ever been at a dinner party where that's happened? Some people start shaking their heads in shock and disbelief at what Mary is doing in this moment. As they watch, Mary shakes the last few drops of perfume out of the flask. She unties her long flowing hair that's a bit like mine. And then suddenly she stoops down to wipe the feet of Jesus with her hair. The shock silence is broken only by the murmuring sounds that eventually swell into a tirade of angry words from very predictable lips in the story. Why all of this waste? Why was this fragrant perfume not sold and 25,000 given to the poor? I found myself wondering if I was there, how would I have responded? Would I have said, what a waste, that's 25 grand down the drain. You see, without understanding why Mary did what she did in this moment, we probably all would have joined in with the chorus of disapproval. Thinking of all the possible good things that we could have done with that precious commodity. And then I think to myself, but what if I was Mary in this moment? What if I was the one who was busy sloshing the perfume all around? Would I have stopped as soon as the fragrant filled room also started to fill with the sound of my critics? You know, I have a horrible feeling I might well have stopped. But verse seven is brilliant. Jesus says, leave her alone. She's anticipating the day of my burial. You're always going to have the poor around you, but you're not always going to have me. You see, Mary in this moment shows the heart of a true worshipper. And what makes her gift so beautiful is that it was so costly. It was priceless, but it was prideless too. You know, she doesn't care what her critics think as she offers her worship. Now, good old Judas, of course, didn't get this, but neither did the other disciples. The other gospels say that all of the other disciples were also drawn into the same complaint. And you see, people won't always understand when we give that which is costly to us to God. But Mary didn't stop worshipping God lavishly. She listened to her heart and not to her critics. And that thrilled the heart of Jesus. I feel really challenged today by the example of Mary to worship without the restrictive chains of approval. I wonder if you worship wearing chains I wonder if sometimes your worship leading or your offering to the worship team is somehow chained. Maybe today is the day to let the chains clunk to the floor, to let your heart be free. So as I close, I want you just to ponder a question before we head into a time of response. I wonder who in the story you can identify with most. Maybe it's Martha. Somebody who in their ministry context, as they're offering their act of worship, the using of their their gifts is to quietly potter behind the scenes. You're not up front, but you're definitely behind the scenes. You're a techie, maybe. Can I encourage you to be encouraged today? Because your act of worship and the offering of your gifts is essential. And it probably is enabling the different ministries of another person. I know I couldn't do what I do without all the Marthas who are serving quietly behind the scenes in our church. Or maybe you're not Martha. Maybe you can identify to Lazarus. Maybe you're using your experience of Jesus, some of your gifting, some of your um, testimony in order to passionately signpost others towards Jesus. Maybe you're a songwriter or a creative, perhaps, and you use your experience of Christ and your life experience to write words and lyrics that are a signpost that will point others towards Jesus? Would you continue to use the gifts that God has given you to be a signpost? Or maybe in this story today, you respond and you relate to Mary. Can I encourage you to let your heart be free in worship, to not be chained by the restrictive chains of the approval of others? Don't be silenced in your worship. Don't be silenced in your leading of worship. Don't become despondent because of the critics in your church.
but use the gifts that God has given you in his body as part of the worship team to bless others. So whether you're serving silently, whether you're a signpost to others, or whether you're leaving worship at the front and enabling others in their worship, can I encourage you to be encouraged in the ministry that you're involved in? Because it is a great asset in the kingdom of God.